Okay, my apologies for the delay, but uh, we're ready to get started. Um, I, uh, when I started teaching, we did um, overheads, uh, you know, the transparencies, and sometimes I wish for those days. <laughs> Anyways, um, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Um, I'd like to introduce our speakers this afternoon, or this morning, um, Dr. Michael Bird and Dr. Linda Clayton. Um, Dr. Bird and Dr. Clayton are both physicians. After earning their Master's of Public Health and Health Policy and Management from Harvard School of Public Health in 92, uh, they have both maintained continuous appointments at the Harvard School of Public Health and the Harvard Medical School uh, for 24 years and are currently adjunct professors at Meharry Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee. Dr. Bird is director of the Institute for Optimizing Health and Healthcare, and Dr. Clayton is co-director of the Institute, as well as an independent health policy consultant. They are both public health practitioners, health policy researchers, and internationally recognized scholars. Um, uh, I have a few highlights from their um, CV and biographical sketches. Uh, Dr. Bird is a board certified obstetrician and gyneco gynecologist and has practiced medicine for over two decades in both private practice and academic medicine. He served as battalion surgeon in the United States Army Medical Corps during Vietnam and was awarded the Bronze Star Medal. Dr. Bird started his research on the health of African American and disadvantaged populations in 1968 with the focus on health disparities. Dr. Clayton joined him as his health disparities co-investigator in 1988. Dr. Clayton is a board certified obstetrician and gynecologist and the first African American woman to be subspecialty trained in surgical gynecologic oncology. She has provided over two decades of direct patient care through radical pelvic surgery and, and other oncologic therapeutic interventions for women with pelvic malig malignancies. She has extensive experience in enrolling patients into cancer clinical trials and has conducted biomedical research in laboratory and clinical settings since the early 1980s. Doctors Bird and Clayton are nationally and internationally recognized authorities on African American and disadvantaged populations racial and ethnic disparities, health reform, health equity, and diversity issues. They are well published and recipients of numerous awards. They've been called upon as consultants by presidential administrations, the Institute of Medicine, and the Congressional Black Caucus, National, In National Association of the Advancement of Colored People, and many other national and international forums. They both hold honorary doctorate degrees in humanities and education. There are many decades of medical public health and health policy work allied with their academic discourse, scholarship, and research are documented in findings from their nationally and internationally authoritative two-volume Pulitzer Prize nominated books, An American Health Dilemma. They are currently working on the second edition and third volume of this book. So please um, join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Byrd and Dr. Linda Clayton. much, Dr. Kazia. Can everybody hear us? Can you hear us very well? Oh, thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. And it is indeed an honor and a pleasure for us to be with you today. What we're going to do, this will be a two-part presentation. Michael will provide the first part, and I will provide the second part. And we do ask that you hold your questions until the end of both presentations. And I reintroduce uh, you to my husband, Dr. Bird. <laughs> okay. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, thanks for the wonderful introduction. Uh, I'd like to wish everyone health, happiness, and world peace for the rest of 2016. In this mini seminar version of racial and ethnic health and healthcare disparities and dysfunction, historical and contemporary issues, we're going to examine approximately 2,500 years of public health, medical, and health history in about 40 minutes. <laughs> okay? Uh, some of the information presented in this talk may be sensitive to some of you. Uh, however, we as physicians, healthcare professionals, public health practitioners, and scientists must confront our truths and our realities if we are to effectively deal with the disparities, diversity, and dysfunction problems. The first part of the mini-seminar is titled, 
disparities, inequities, and dysfunction in the U.S. health and healthcare system, origins, evolution, perpetuation, configurations, and mechanisms. We, I have no conflicts of interest, and I would like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Cozier and her department, Megan Ke Keating, uh, and the other members of our IOHHC uh, staff. Okay. Glitch in the computer. We must first acknowledge that African Americans have had the worst health status, the worst health outcome, and the worst health services delivery than any other racial or ethnic group in the United States since our arrival here in 1619, or 397 years ago. Thus, African Americans serve well as a teaching model for understanding U.S. health disparities, health system dysfunction, and the flawed American medical social culture. Our credo has always been that if we are to solve the problems of racial, ethnic, and class-based health inequities, disparities, and lack of diversity, we must first understand the problems. The entire story, along with its background, had never been told until we attempted to tell it in An American Health Dilemma, our two-volume book, which was released in 2000 and 2002. Both volumes were nominated for the Pulitzer Prize. From the scores of academic disciplines required to stitch this complicated story together, here are 28 or so examples of the fields that we had to encounter. However, for this presentation, we've honed in on these seven core areas, medicine and healthcare and their histories, medical sociology, healthcare economics and its history, public health and its history, health policy and its history, the history of science, and racial and ethnic studies. And we've tracked these core areas from antiquity to the present day. Western biomedicine began with Imhotep, the first Egyptian physician of note in history. He was probably black and dominated Western medicine for more than 2,000 years. However, hanging over our scientific and health systems like a dark cloud is our flawed medical, social, culture, and practices. Predating Plato and Aristotle's 2,500-year-old, quote, great chain of being and augmented by the blind acceptance of hierarchical thinking, ideology, pedagogy, behavior, and practices based on the reification of races, ethnicities, classes, and gender, the system evolved into one incorporating scientific racism, misogyny, unethical biomedical and experimental exploitation, and elaborate theories of racial, gender, ethnic, and class inferiority. This ideological, philosophical, and pedagogical menu of theories, biases, and practices permeates our culture and deeply distorts Western and U.S. medical, clinical practice, scientific, and academic traditions. Following the Egyptian and Mesopotamian scientific and medical dominance, many feel that Plato and Aristotle began their era of dominance in the next epoch in Western science and biomedicine beginning around 500 BC. Their creation, the great chain of being, is one of the oldest philosophical, theoretical ideas and philosophical systems and ideological frameworks in Western culture. It represents a major root of Western racism and scientific racism, flowing from the superior complex to the inferior simple. The racism here is both explicit and implicit. The ideal Apollo Greek male at the top of the chain, followed by a man of color directly above some type of ape 
on down to the opossums and the sharks. From Western scientific, social, religious, and biomedical roots arose the science-based race other hierarchical axis, which shaped and molded Western culture's ideological, philosophical, and intellectual foundations until at least the 16th century. Few recall race as a word did not exist in the English language until 1508. It first appeared in an English dictionary in 1580. Nevertheless, it had begun affecting health and health care delivery as early as the Greco-Roman eras. By the 16th century, scientific racism and societal racism were respected members of Western civilization, as are some of the examples of scientific icons who contributed to the racist philosophy. Marcello Malpighi, the father of histology. Johann Blumenbach, the father of anthropology. Carlo Linnaeus, the father of biological classification who named us Homo sapiens. Georges Cuvier and Charles Darwin, who formulated the theory of evolution. And Sir Francis Galton, the father of biometry and eugenics. Peter Camper, Anders Retzius, and Paul Broker, who all made anatomy breakthroughs, which some of us are familiar with, who went to medical, dental, or any other health uh, practices schools, uh, also contributed to the scientific racist academic cor corpus. This 19th century medical textbook depicting blacks in trees with apes and this 20th century medical textbook titled America's Greatest Problem, The Negro, written by R.W. Schufelt, M.D., a major in the U.S. Army Medical Corps and member of the many prestigious scientific societies listed on the left, demonstrate that scientific racism and racial inferiority theories were in high gear. This flawed medical social culture profoundly impacted U.S. science, biomedicine, society, health, and health care. These forces affected and produced disparities in health and health care and society in the United States until the present day, as is noted in these and many other highly acclaimed or recognized books. These events also triggered another bevy of books focused on solving the health system and health problems. Now, let's refocus on English North American and later the United States health experience. From its very beginnings between 1607 and 1619, our research revealed that our health system was structured and based on race and class. There was a separate traditional health system for Native Americans, a mainstream health system for European people of means, and a subsystem for the, quote, poor. It mirrored Western European health systems in many ways. The poor, along with the slaves after 1619, were divided into worthy and unworthy categories. Filters based on traits strongly embedded in the American character were used to make these determinations. Some of these filters were the Calvinist ethic, the Puritan ethic, the Protestant ethic, class and racial considerations, and being members of incarcerated or prison populations. There were also stigma disease filters. Some of these were out of wedlock pregnancies, venereal diseases such as syphilis and gonorrhea, infectious diseases such as leprosy and tuberculosis, and mental illness was a major stigma. And until very recently, cancer was considered a stigma disease. Our most recent example is HIV AIDS. After 1619, black chattel slavery became a major force in English North America 
and later the United States. As James Oliver Horton said, slavery in America was no sideshow in American history. It was the main event. The entire fabric of the social system was affected by what was happening in the scientific realm. And as you know, the social system, of which the health system is a major part, consists of the economic system, educational system, legal system, governmental system, the population itself, the environment itself, our culture, and the health system, and their services. In the late 15th century, the Atlantic slave trade had begun in Africa with the so-called slave wars, the, quote, roundups, and the march from the African interior to the African coasts. These phases of the slave trade extracted a mortality rate of at least 50%, according to our research. Storage facilities on the African coast, such as Goree Island in Senegal, Elmina Castle in Ghana, Cape Coast Castle in Ghana, along with outdoor storage facilities such as barracoons up and down the West African coast, storage cells within the network of castles along the coast, and impro improvised imprisonment camps such as the one you see here, led to a coastal African slave death rate of at least 25%. This was combined with a 15 to 50 percent slave mortality during the middle passage of the voyage across the Atlantic to the New World. This was followed by a breaking in period death rate of 30 to 50 percent. This entire process established what we've coined a, quote, slave health deficit, unquote, that was perpetuated in America. This slave health deficit has never been made up. Today, it is euphemistically known as, quote, health disparities. After the forced immigration of African slaves, America grew and became a wealthy republic between 1619 and 1865. The health system became more complex, and a, quote, slave health subsystem was added to the lower tiers of the system. The filters for the poor remained in place. In the post-Civil War era, after dissolution of the Freedmen's Bureau Health System in 1872, the rise and fall of the, quote, Negro medical ghetto took place in a racially segregated health system in the century between 1865 and 1965. Much of the racial and class segregation of our health system remains today. With other 20th century developments, military systems of health care and a formal Indian health service arose alongside a de jure desegregated, de facto segregated, quote, public sector subsystem. Even today, remnants of the multi tiered system remain with Native Americans off to the side with the Indian Health Service and the populations largely segregated based on race, ethnicity, immigrant status, and class. White, middle, and upper class Americans patronize the mainstream system while most blacks, other disadvantaged groups, are trapped in a, quote, public sector subsystem made up of public hospitals, health departments, community health centers, neighborhood health centers, and so on. During this era, there was a new player in the mix, the Netherworld Health System, which designated patients having no official designation. These were largely made up of undocumented or homeless people. Because of the Affordable Care Act in, 19, in 2010, the desegregated, de facto segregated, quote, mainstream health system was augmented by a deteriorating, largely white middle class and, quote, new poor Americans. They were subsidized to receive inflated, quote, private insurance. 
The ACA also expanded Medicaid to cover a larger segment of medically indigent, poor, and minority Americans. Almost 20 states have refused to comply with the law. Native Americans, veterans, and the military remain off to the side with the military system, the VA, and there is also the Indian Health Service. Other populations continue to be largely segregated on the basis of race, ethnicity, immigrant status, and class. White, middle, and upper class Americans patronize the mainstream system, while most blacks and other disadvantaged groups remain trapped in inadequate and inferior combined public-private sector subsystems made up of public hospitals, uh, hospitals that could not escape the inner cities and move to the suburbs, health departments, community health centers, neighborhood health centers, etc. The, quote, netherworld health system has grown is now more than 29 million people and growing up, growing again because of locked out uh, patients due to the failures of the Affordable Care Act. As you ponder the information in the boxes on the right in the tables, you see the African American health experience reflects their citizenship status. We, as African Americans, have enjoyed most of our citizenship rights for less than 13% of our time over here. To understand the origins, evolution, and function of the U.S. health system, we must focus on the concepts of culture, structure, and function, and how they impact health, health care inequities, disparities, and dysfunction. For more understanding, the modern health disparities engine can be broken up into four parts. Provider factors, which are composed of unequal treatment, biased clinical decision making, stereotyping and discrimination, all documented in the IOM's epical unequal treatment study. Patient factors made up of demographics, communication, language, culture, and religion. Most of these things are beyond patient control. Health system factors based on financing, structure, tiering of the system, which we've talked about, segregation based on race and class, process factors, and a poisonous medical social culture. Community factors such as social determinants, health system and residential segregation, access factors and no sense of, quote, community about health among the American public. Putting it simplistically, the system which in 1900 had to serve a 90 to 95 percent European white population now uh, has got to serve a multiracial, multi-ethnic, SES diverse patient population in 2016 and into the 21st century. And it has never served the entire population. Further complicating this already complex mis mix is uh, these other factors that contribute uh, to the health disparities. In summary, the roots of racial, ethnic, and class inequities and disparities in Western and later American medicine and health care are over 2,500 years old. What else did we learn? The legacy of health inequities and disparities for African Americans in this country is almost 400 years old. For Native Americans, it's 500 years. The African American health experience parallels their citizenship status in many ways. We also learned that an American health dilemma documents two periods of health reform to address black health inequities and disparities. There was a first reconstruction in black health between 1865 and 1872 after the Civil War. <laughs> There was a second reconstruction in black health from 1965 to 1975 
uh, in wake of the black civil rights movement. The U.S. health system was created, structured, and evolved on the basis of race, ethnicity, and class. The U.S. health system, we also found out, has never served all Americans fairly or equitably. The final lesson was that the over 100-year, quote, market experiment has failed for racial, ethnic, and class-based inequities, disparities, and dysfunction in U.S. health and health care and health care services remain. These malfunctions persist and in some cases have worsened despite, quote, market experiments, unquote, in health care financing, market justice, market-based structuring of the system, and attempts at market-based health care delivery. And so what is our challenge that we face? The first thing we know is the health system must undergo drastic change, led by health professionals. Some of you here in this room, hopefully, will be at the forefront of this change, because that's what you're here for, OK? Uh, to lead us in changing this health system. You'll need to ally with our institutions in our communities and with our politicians in order to effect this change. Uh, and then the system will be able to serve this increasingly diverse, multi-ethnic, multicultural population for the first time. Now we will proceed to the contemporary configuration of African American and disadvantaged health and health care inequities and health care disparities and inequalities. This venture will be led by Dr. Clayton. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. We're going to switch to the next uh, lecture, which I will be providing. And if somebody can help me switch this one, I'm not used to this computer. Okay. Uh, in the meantime, my presentation is going to build on the presentation that Dr. Bird just provided and look more at the contemporary aspects and hopefully we will be able to make some connections between what's happening now as a continuum uh, of what Dr. Bird has presented uh, to us thus far. Now, Dr. Bird presented some compelling information on our historical backlay of what's happening today. And in, in my presentation, you will not see the historical illustrations, but we will actually provide some statistics toward the end. But we will look at the multiple variables that are contributing to inequities uh, that lead to disparities uh, in our health and health delivery system at this time. So uh, I think Yvette is bringing up my presentation now. <laughs> We're still trying to find it. So maybe we'll take one question because we're running out of time while, for Dr. Bird while we're trying to find my I, presentation. One B. Whoops, I started. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Take your uh, did anybody have a compelling question right now? Yeah, we should because take advantage of the time because we covered an immense uh, amount of ground. Anybody? Yes. Yes. Moral. What 
was the question? I'm sorry. Race, class, and moral factors. I race, class, and moral factors as it relates to. Okay. When you talk about um, the relationship between the health system and our citizenship status, is that the chart that you're speaking of? Oh, the, was it the boxes with the diagrams? Okay. Oh, the Puritan ethic, the Calvinist okay. ethic, and all of those. Yes. Yes, all of these, all of these judgments were imposed on patients. In fact, uh, in colonial times here in Massachusetts, for example, which was one of the booming colonies uh, uh, in the British Empire. Uh, the town elders really had to decide which patients were going to be admitted to the almshouse, poorhouse hospital and whether the, a, per, a person could be admitted. And of course, the, the, the rector or the preacher or whoever, the religious leaders were prominent members of these community boards and they they made these decisions. And so, yes, it was a very strict, uh, like unwed mothers and things. That was just a horrible problem uh, during all of those centuries. And, and so, yes, and all of these things were imposed, these standards were imposed on the poor, of course. And, and, and uh, that, how would we say, it started establishing the habit in our health system of discriminating against people and victim blaming them for being poor. Because you say a health system isn't supposed to do that, but that's, it happened in America and that's how it happened. Okay? Is that, does that? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, we have my slides up, but they're not uh, showing on the screen here. Yes. Oh, yes. In the meantime, we'll take one more uh, one This more gentleman question. over here had a question. Yes. Dr. Burry, do we lose anything in contextualizing the whole discussion around race and ethnicity and class and ethnicity 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 that's exactly what you will find in volume one. <laughs> okay, we can't, we just don't have time to cover this. We've actually capsulized both of these 1,500 pages in this 40-minute presentation. So we have, we can't, okay, we've dealt with that, though. And if you direct it as a question, I'll try to answer it. Okay. Do we lose something and narrowing it to the Well, to this, this, this is what this is what happened. Like many research projects, especially when you're talking about public health, which is consists of qualitative, quantitative, and semi-quantitative levels of research. Okay, it's not it's not an exact science like mathematics, physics, or chemistry where there's right and wrong answers. Everything is a shade of gray, I guess you could say. You follow the, you follow the, the, the information. What my initial quest, I thought, was just simply going to be race. Okay, I thought that all of these problems we were having were due to race and racial discrimination. As I looked back on the problem, I found out that the discriminatory situation extended far beyond race. People were in the medical fields were discriminating against women. They were discriminating against, in Texas, I grew up in Texas, they were discriminating against Mexicans. They were discriminating against Native Americans. So it, it, it all of a sudden, Don, this is a, this is a bigger thing. And in fact, the same scientists 
who were writing the articles in the medical journals documenting our inferiority were the same ones documenting the inferiority of women, Latinos, Asians, or any woman who wasn't a Northern European white. Do you see what I'm saying? And it went back, and it went back beyond the medieval universities. Then I found out it, it had ancient roots going back to Greco-Roman times. The first really organized system of discrimination was the great chain of being. Because you saw the chart. You don't have to ask any questions about that. It's sitting right there in front of your face. Okay. It's racist. It's hierarchical. It, 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 it quantifies people as being greater or lesser or more important or less important. It does all of those things. But it wasn't called race, because race didn't, wasn't even a word until 1508. And that's why we came up with the term, the race other hierarchical axis. Right. So and so that sort of answers your question. No, it wasn't race when we go all the way back. It was the race other hierarchical axis. And just one before, it looks like we have our computers in sync now. Let's see. Uh, just to add one last thing on that in terms of should we limit it to the United States or African Americans first. It's a Western it's a, culture. Exactly. Western cultural phenomenon. And relative to the uh, United States versus others, even today, if you look at the disparities international, which is not our focus, but we've done some research on that too, you can put the map, Michael can probably say this, across the world, the countries with the worst disparities are where the colonial systems existed. Before. So if, before. So if we were to study that, then we could find that you need not limit it to America, but we're talking about the United States. But if you go global with it, you're going to find that the same kinds of disparities exist where the previous colonial system were. And you can just take that map and you can see that it is a worldwide phenomenon. Wherever uh, the West is touched. Right. So thank goodness we have the screen such that we can start with part B and hopefully there will be time for some uh, Q&A after we finish my presentation. Yeah, we had some good uh, questions. Yeah. Yes, we did, and thank you for <laughs> those questions. We want to uh, reemphasize, as uh, Michael has pointed out, we as African Americans have had the worst health status, the worst health uh, outcomes, and the worst service delivery than any other population group in the United States since 1619. Now, as we get started here, we want to first dispel some myths provide a few definition, some core facts. Now, why do we need to dispel myths? Because myths often serve a protective role by providing comfort such that deeply held convictions are not challenged. Now, one of the myths that we all uh, just take for granted is the myth that this uh, issue of racial inferiority came from the KKK or something. No, it came from physicians and biomedical scientists, as Dr. Bird has said, and it spilled over into the lay population and it's just been perpetuating itself. Now, regarding the health system itself, we're only going to be able to address like three of the 25 myths that we've studied. First, we all know that the myth that we have the best health system in the world, that does not exist. Evidence does not support that when you look at other OECD nations. Now, myth two is that racial, ethnic, and class-based health disparities are relatively new phenomenon. We know now that it's not new. Dr. Bird has already uh, informed us that it's a 25-year-old continuum in the West. 2,500. 2,500 years. <laughs> Sorry about that. Myth three. Many have believed until very recently that a huge cause of disparities, they felt it was genetics. Genetic and biological difference are in the past and in the present to some extent 
are thought to be reasons for racial, ethnic, and class-based health differences, disparities, outcomes. We know that the human genome findings have dispelled this, and we have scientific evidence to refute that myth. Now we're going to skip to a few definitions of disparity. All of you in this room know the DHHS def, uh, definition of disparities. Differences in health among segments of the population or demographic group that occur by gender, race, or ethnicity, education, or income, disability, geographic location, or sexual orientation. Now the new definition by HHS is that a health disparity is a particular type of health difference that is closely linked with social, economic, and or environmental disadvantage. Health disparities adversely affect groups of people who have systematically experienced greater obstacles to health based on their racial or ethnic group. Now, we know that both of these definitions are global, however, they are still limited in terms of uh, dis describing and defining disparities, because we know disparities exist in many areas, such as disease-specific health outcomes, cancer, HIV, et cetera. We have huge disparities in service delivery, which is linked to health system structural and process factors. We have large disparities in health insurance status, which is linked to health care financing. We have disparities in access, availability, and all the related variables that you see here. The clinical encounter. There are huge disparities, which are linked to biased clinical decision making. And we have huge disparities in quality of care. Now, who are we talking about when we talk about the disparities crisis? We all know that blacks are most affected. This includes African Americans, Caribbean Americans, the entire African diaspora. Other racial and ethnic groups, as you know, including Native Americans, Mexican Americans, etc. Some employment-based insurance members, including those who are unemployed, underemployed, employed, but cannot afford health insurance, medically indigent individuals, many of whom are new. Some other disadvantaged populations, including the elderly, the poor, disabled civilians and veterans, children, single moms, some uninsured, underinsured, and government-insured populations, some rural populations, and recent immigrants. And each of these groups is becoming increasingly diverse as we speak. Now, what are the characteristics of the contemporary disparities crisis? It is characterized by wide, deep health disparities based on race, ethnicity, class, gender, etc. We have disparate access barriers, which many of us have studied, high uninsured and underinsured rates. We have structural inequalities and inequities in the health system that Dr. Bird walked us through those tiering structure. Uh, we have large populations trapped in the dual unequal tiers of the health system that Dr. Bird has explained to us. We have a chronic racial and medical social problem even today in the health system. All of this in the United States is built upon almost four centuries of dysfunctional ideology, philosophy, science, biomedicine, and clinical practice. Dr. Bird has reviewed with us the engine that is driving today's contemporary disparities, providers, patient factors, health system factors, community factors, et cetera. Now, to fully understand the disparities crisis, we have to remember that the U.S. social system, the health system, as Dr. Bird say, stated, is a part of the social system. All of this is interwoven, and when one part dysfunctions, another part dysfunctions as it relates to moving the health disparities. Now, furthermore, a key point to understand contemporary health disparities, you must understand that there are 12 major structural components of the U.S. health and health services system. 
each of these components is driving the disparities in different kinds of way. First, we have the health professions, your doctors, your nurses, the dentists, etc. Healthcare institutions, the pharmaceutical and medical supply and appliance industries, health education and research systems, the ambulatory systems, community health centers, etc. Healthcare financing, your insurance companies, federal government health and health care, state and local governments health and health care, volunteer agencies, the American Cancer Society, etc. The review and control infrastructure, health law and medical ethics, and Wall Street and its financial sector. Each one of these components is contributing to the movement and pushing disparities. Now, overarching all 12 components, you have the social determinants. And the social determinants are interacting with each of these 12 components and further driving disparities. Then you have health ideology, philosophy, ethics, and social contract. All of these impact each of the 12 components further driving disparities. The medical social culture hugely impacts each of the components and further drives disparities. Healthy People 2010 and 2020, the defocused agendas inadvertently contributes to disparities. Now, we don't know the effects of the Affordable Care Act, and that's to be known in the future. Now, the Healthy People uh, 20, Health United States 2015 had a special feature on racial and ethnic health and health disparities uh, this year. Now, this particular book said, despite improvements over time in many of the health measures presented in this special feature, Disparities by race and ethnicity were found in all 17 measures, according to the latest data, and indicated that although progress has been made in the 30 years since the Heckler Report was released in 1985, elimination of disparities in health and access to care has yet to be achieved. Now, how many in the audience, how many have heard of the Malone Heckler Report? See, show of hands. Okay, ah, well, good. that's a good representation. In many audiences, some people have never heard of it. Uh, Margaret Heckler was from Massachusetts under Ronald Reagan. She released this report in 85, showed huge disparities, and it was a watershed moment, but she actually was fired for releasing that report because he didn't want the evidence to be revealed. We are building on this work that she and T. Thomas Malone uh, started in 85. However, black doctors have been studying disparities since the early 1900s. And there was someone in the audience who came up to us earlier and knows the work of Dr. Montague Cobb, who was one of the pioneers as it relates to health disparities. Now, the new metrics of racial and ethnic health and healthcare disparities in 2016, in addition to infant mortality, maternal mortality, we're looking at these new metrics, which are official for the government now. We have access and utilization of healthcare, births, prenatal and reproductive care, deaths, disability, health expenditures, health insurance, health status and risk factors, the population, and preventive uh, medicine. Now, we're going to shift gears a little bit with that background, and we're going to look at some statistics that relate to Massachusetts as well as overall statistics for the uh, United States. Now, in spite of the plethora of academic institutions here in Massachusetts, of which BU and Harvard and Tufts are here in the city, we're still faced, as you know, with huge disparities throughout the uh, uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts as well as Boston proper. And these disparities have not been uh, decreased very much 
since the 2006 implementation of the model for the Affordable Care Act, or Romney Care, and they have not disappeared since implementation of the uh, Affordable Care Act itself. Now, in an article in the British Medical Journal, it stated the following, Massachusetts reform failed to reduce racial and, and ethnic disparities. Effects of Massachusetts healthcare reform on racial and ethnic disparities and admission to hospitals for ambulatory care sensitive uh, conditions, respective, retrospective analysis of hospital episode statistics. They concluded that Massachusetts reform was not associated with significant lower overall racial and ethnic disparities and rates of admission to hospital for ambulatory sensitive uh, conditions. In the, UN, in the United States and Massachusetts in particular, additional efforts might need to be done to improve <laughs> access to, to outpatient care and reduce preventable admissions. Now, I would change that might to we definitely need to do something differently. <laughs> now, in a news article, it again stated that racial ethnic health disparities per persist in the United States according to the CDC. So now, let us just uh, look at some Massachusetts-specific data. Now, when we can look at Massachusetts data and U.S. data, we want to make it clear this is not a direct comparison. We're just looking at Massachusetts in 2010 and 2013 for the most part, and we'll be looking at some outcome data for the United States in 2014. Now, here you can see Infant mortality rate in 2010 for Massachusetts was higher in blacks. When you came to Boston, the rates were still higher in blacks compared to others. And if you looked at Boston from 20, uh, 2008 to 12, again, blacks led in infant mortality. And if you look at the entire United States in 2013, here you can see the black rate exceeded all others significantly. Now, going back to Massachusetts, if you looked at premature death rates in 2013, clearly blacks had the highest rate. If you look at age-adjusted death rates for blacks in 2010, they had the highest rates compared to others. Age-adjusted death rates by race and ethnicity in 2013, whites were slightly higher than blacks. If you looked at the whole United States in 2014, you can see that blacks were doing worse than anyone else. Moving back to cancer death rates in Massachusetts in 2010, blacks and white rates were similar. If you looked at 2013, again, blacks and whites were similar, but blacks exceeded just a little bit. Moving to the uh, entire uh, United States in 2014, if you looked at cancer death rates, we as blacks had the highest rates. Heart disease, back in Massachusetts in 2010, we had the highest rate. If you look at heart disease in 2013, whites had the highest rates. If you look at the entire United States in 2014, again, blacks had the highest rates. Stroke death rates in Massachusetts in 2010, blacks had the highest rates. In 2013 in Massachusetts, blacks had the highest stroke death rates. And if you looked at the United States in 2014, again, blacks had the highest rates. If you look in Massachusetts for diabetes death rates in 2010, blacks had the highest rates. 2013, blacks had the highest rate. If you look at the United States in 2014, blacks had the highest rates. So we could go on and on and on, and in most instances, blacks will have the highest death rates, but time doesn't allow us to do more. So what we have done is track this, uh, the black-white differences and disadvantaged population differences in the United States since the English North American uh, colonies. And this Boston Globe article referenced our book in this tracking, and we can see that throughout the history of this country, blacks have done worse 
than other population groups and usually followed by Native Americans as well as Latinos and then poor whites. And of course, this graphic was done by the Boston Globe several years ago and we want to thank Dr. Cozier for updating it all the way up to the Affordable Care Act. Now, if we skip to today with the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, we now know that the past two efforts of health reform in the United States, as mentioned by Dr. Byrd, first uh, just after the Civil War and then again in the 1960s after the black uh, civil rights movement, these were not adequately funded, they were not structurally or medically corrected, and racial and ethnic and class-based disparities continued. We now have the Affordable Care Act. While it is the most comprehensive health care legislation to be passed by the executive, judicial, and legislative branch of the United States Con Congress, it falls short of a comprehensive uh, plan that equitably serves all patients. And as Dr. Byrd said, over 20 some states did even sign on it. And so we have a lot of work to do as we go forward. Now, looking at the 10 titles of the Affordable Care Act, it is not reassuring that we will eliminate health disparities with the approaches that we have and all of the other political issues uh, around health care. It's not going to happen anytime soon. And it will be up to you in the audience, allied with the community and many others, to make it happen as if we are to reach equity in the future. Now, at this watershed period of our history, as I conclude, we can finally ask some questions. Where are we? What must we do? And what does the future hold as it relates to eliminating health and health disparities in the United States and reaching equity for all populations? First, we can pose the question, can the health system shed the dark legacies of its racial ethical health policy and medical social past that Dr. Byrd spoke of? Can we analyze, reform, and implement fundamental changes in our medical social culture? Can we affect change in public attitudes toward health and health care? Can the American people and a committed cadre of health pro professionals regain control of the medical industrial complex? The term health reform has been abused so often and for so long, we must reinvent our health system. And we can ask the question, are the Affordable Care Act, the HHS Action Plan to reduce, not eliminate health disparities and Healthy People 2020, we can ask, are they a good enough start to take us to where we need to be in eliminating disparities? Health professions accountability must be redefined in ethical public health, social contract, political health policy, and financial terms. So since this is such a huge problem to get your arms around, and it is multi-layered and multiple variables contributing concurrently, it is, a, it is something that has to be addressed by multiple people coming from multiple directions. And we leave you with the words of Nkosi Johnson, who was a 12-year-old South African boy who was denied treatment as well as education and now an AIDS victim. Nkosi said, do all you can with what you have in the time you have and in the place you are. And we'd like to thank you very much for your attention and we will take a few questions now. We have time for a couple of questions. Yes, sir. In your research, have you found a healthcare system or a country where the health, uh, the healthcare disparities are minimal that we can model 
or hours after. Yes, and many of the OECD nations, particularly the ones that are more homogeneous, uh, they actually have systems that work far better than our system. They serve the population better. They spend less of their GDP, and their outcomes are much better. The measure of whether the country is doing well or poor, one of the key measures would be your outcomes, your, uh, whether the patients are getting access to care, and then whether their health status is better than ours, and then their outcomes, their death rates, et cetera, maternal mortality, infant mortality. So we don't have time to go into it, but if you look at many of the OECD nations, in fact, there was a report that was put out just a couple of years ago, and the United States is down there near the bottom. Yeah. Is it that when you talk about a homogeneous population, uh, is it that these factors are dragged down by a very large population, which is... No, uh, I don't think that is the uh, main thing, but they have a different way. Uh, their health system is structured differently, and many of them have unitary health systems where everybody gets the same level of care, be it a homogeneous population or not, uh, based on the way the system is structured and based on the way the system is financed. And so here, nobody wants to have a system that takes care of the poor or right. take care of the indigent. And those countries have systems that have equity that's built into their systems. Yeah. You, 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 mm -hmm. Okay. And, I, and we, we, to add to that, part of the problem is we have a diverse population. We were brought over here involuntarily, didn't want to come, were dragged over here. Now, how America has dealt with diversity historically from 1607 to 2016 is heavily responsible for these health disparities. And that's one of the things that you get. This is the only book that chronicles the entire American health experience from the very beginning that includes everybody. Mm -hmm. We include African Americans, Native Americans, we include Latino Americans, the GLBTQ community, everybody. Mm -hmm. Nobody else does that. Rosemary Stevens doesn't do it. Paul Starr doesn't do it. There's no other book. Right, and I want to add one thing. When I worked in the National Health Care uh, National Health Service System in uh, Great Britain, uh, no one, regardless of whether you were from Africa, whether you were a person of color, whether you lived out in the Hebrides, you actually had access to the same uh, level of health care. And believe it or not, even Queen Elizabeth, who's got her uh, doctors to come into her home and she can access the other system, she still Go used uses the national, the national health. health system. So though when people are seen as equal biologically and deserving, then systems can be developed from a financial standpoint to serve everyone equitably. I know that's a simplistic answer, but we are running out of time. But yes, there are systems in the world that not only function better than ours, they're financed differently, and of course they serve the population in an equi equitable manner, regardless of race, class, gender, et cetera. Yes. Well, well actually, we have to. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm being given the, the, the wrap up sign. So, um, so Sandra, will we be able we? to take a few questions outside? Or? We can take a few questions outside because okay. there's a class coming in. But um, I think uh, Dean Galea was coming um, for one second. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me get there. I just wanted to um, formally thank our speakers. I wanted to formally apologize for the AV snafus. It's uh, really, really sorry that that complicated your life. But uh, you have um, come at a perfect time for us as a school. It really helped move our conversation forward. Thank you for giving us your time. Sorry.